Well, man, we're not live yet. It's still... All right, we're live now. Okay, so hello everyone. Before we start, just a quick sound check. Can one of you guys write in the chat box to say that you can hear us and see the slides actually on the screen as well, please? Hello. And I'll turn off my camera. No one wants to see me. Hi, can you hear me? Anyone? Cool. They can. Okay. Yes, great. Hi, everyone. Um, so I think I'll get started. Um, great, you can hear. Um, so I'm uh, uh, Prashant. I'm an uh, anaesthetic doctor at um, in London. Um, thank you for being here this evening. Um, I'm going to give this talk around what to do with medications and fluids um leading up to an operation and what to do about it afterwards um so the aims of this talk are to really give a whistle stop tour regarding things that you may see quite often on on the boards and um although most of these things are done by the um, anesthetists or the uh, pre-operative assessment team it is important that you understand what's happening on your ward. Um, so if someone comes into the ward and they have something done and then they're going home, it's nice to appreciate, oh, okay, so that was stopped because of this reason, or it's okay to um, continue it. And that's what I'll be explaining to you. Um, so, and just before I go ahead, I will say that although there are uh, guidelines in place you will find if i mean if there are any um s students here or certainly doctors already there is a lot of deviation from what should be done so i can only say what is advised but you will find that in the real world things are like mm, well this medication should be stopped but actually we'll uh, um we will not so as long as you can understand the rationale or what generally happens, that's um, what you can uh, take away from this talk. So these are the list of things that we'll be um, discussing and um, hopefully you will get something from it. So um, when you think about s surgery, it's extremely important that you have clearly in your mind, is this operation one that was planned to happen from many days or many weeks or many months ahead of the date, or is it something that was unplanned? So um, that's what we call, um, so that's when we start thinking about our elective surgery versus our emergency surgery. Now, most operations in the world are, are are um, uh, elective, so you would have a knee operation, or you would have some insertion of a stent, or you have a, uh, a tumor removed. And so, so, in these instances, you have enough time to think about: okay, so what is this person's um, HB? How how is their walking? Are they smoking? Um, are they overweight? Uh, can we encourage weight loss leading up to it? Can we book a HDU bed? Can we book an ITU bed? Um, if they have heart failure or if they have AF, can we um, refer them to the outpatient uh, um, services, get seen by the heart failure team, optimize their medications over the course of a few months or weeks so that they are, their heart is in, is in the best state that it can be leading up to the operation. Um, same with if someone has very bad asthma or very bad COPD, are they on um, the correct inhalers? If they have diabetes, are they on the correct um, medication at the correct dose so that the HbA1c is at, is at an optimum level. So this is what we mean by um, by the optimization uh, process. And certainly, if any of you are applying for anaesthetics, if you can discuss these things at your interview, uh, this is what makes you stand out in in the um, interview process. 
Um, so, so that's all when you know the operation is um, occurring. On the other hand, you get uh, uh, emergency surgery, and that is what's called NC pod or C pod. Um, if someone says, oh, yeah, you know, uh, let's book the patient on the C pod list, that's what it means. This is unplanned surgery. This is a surgery that needs to happen immediately. So perhaps someone has been run over by a bus and been brought into the hospital, or if someone has uh, appendicitis and it needs to be done um, within the day, or someone has an a um, uh, a ruptured ectopic, or someone um, needs to have a cat to a cesarean section. These are all uh, emergency operations. And anything can walk in uh, through the door. You have no idea at the point of them walking in what their heart is doing or um, what their lungs are doing, what their blood sugar is doing. You don't know if they have had a uh, uh, heart attack last month and if they have um, badly controlled diabetes. And these patients are often, but not always, quite... Um, they are lacking in the reserve uh, because they haven't been eating for a day, because they haven't been drinking for many days on end, because they've lost all their uh, fluid. So this is what you have to thinking about. And But most importantly, as when you talk about this and this slide here, is that you, you cannot control if they've just had their warfarin, if they've just had their... Uh, uh, clopidogrel, and you have to think about um, um, what you can do. So this talk will be talking about um, what you can do if someone is has a date or even a time for their operation, and they're on all these medications, and what you can do. And this can be, we're going to operate in one hour, what do we do about their aspirin, their we're going to operate on on them in three months. What do we do about their dose of the metformin, certainly leading up to the operation date and on the morning of? Um, and really, as, when you think about surgery, the reason why we have to think about why we have to alter the, the dose of the medication or if they um, receive it at all is is because you are intentionally making them not eat you are making them not drink, you are affecting the way that their gut will absorb things, you may be inducing an AKI or making their AKI worse, um, you are putting, they are, if they are there for emergency surgery, they are most likely in a sympathetic state, they having a surge of, uh, of adrenaline that will put up your sugars, um, that will play havoc with all your normal functioning of the way that your body works. Um, and of course, having certainly having a laparotomy is like being run over by a bus. Your body experiences that same stress response. And it really is really important that you can optimize people's um, medication. So, so the first thing, or even if it's the only thing that you can um, go back after um, this talk is this. Being nil by mouth does not mean that you take nothing. If you are nil by mouth from 8 o'clock in the morning and you are due to take aspirin at 8.30 in the morning and you are allowed to do so, you can have sips of water. And this is so important because I see many people who unfortunately have systolic blood pressures of 190 whilst under a general anaesthetic because they have missed their morning dose of am 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 amlodipine because they have been told to not take your regular medications because you are nil by mouth. That does not, that is not what it means. Nil by mouth means don't eat anything and certainly don't have large amounts of water leading up to two hours before your planned operation but you can have sips of water to have your medication and that is really um, important to understand so um, we will start with the first group of um, medications and this is something that you see quite often 
Um, this is anything that makes your blood thin. So um, let's take this um, man who I've just made up, but you will see quite often. It's a guy who's elderly and he's booked to have a planned operation, let's say in one month's time, to have um, changes of stents which he's had, which he's has in which he has had inserted a few months before in one of his ureters this is a man who's got copd he's on home oxygen and he's got bronchiectasis so clearly he's got very bad lungs lastly he had a heart attack and he's on um dual antiplatelets but his renal function's okay and then so the plan is to do a is to do this operation under a spinal anesthetic. So you inject some local anesthetic into his subarachnoid space. You make his belly button downwards numb. And then, so you have to think about what do we do about the, the fact that he's on aspirin and clopidogrel. So the fact that he's having a spinal anesthetic means that you have to be very careful about if someone's blood is too thin. That aside, you also have to think about your you're having an operation. So even if it's under a general anesthetic where there is no risk of bleeding into someone's spine, what are you going to do about the, this patient's aspirin and clopidogrel? So this is what we do. For most operations, you can take aspirin. And that is the kind of general rule. There are some things where you want, you don't want even a drop of blood, such as surgery on the eye, if there's a, if there's a certain risk of particular bleeding. Um, but certainly most operations, it is okay to take your regular aspirin. However, clopidogrel, no. You will find that most patients have been instructed to stop uh, uh, clopidogrel a week before the day of their um, their planned operation. Obviously, if someone has just walked in through the door with a ruptured spleen or a ruptured gallbladder, and they've had the clopidogrel that morning, that is a that is that is a bit of a minefield, and you have to talk with the uh, 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 hematologists and the surgeons as to what the bleeding risk is, if there is any chance it can be managed conservatively until the clopidogrel is less of a risk. Um, but to, for most instances, it is okay to be on aspirin. And that is something that you should understand. And I know it's very annoying when people are uh, people are uh, giving a lecture and they say, "Oh, just read this." However, this document is excellent. If you have it on your phone, that's even more excellent, and it's uh, written by the AGBI. Um, and I'm not going to go through this, through this table, obviously, but this unambiguously clearly explains to you how long you have to wait after receiving any antiplatelet or any anticoagulant to receive a spinal anesthetic. And by that, you can, prob you can infer how safe it is to have a laparotomy, to have someone's appendix uh, removed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if there is a bleeding risk uh, with the operation, you can look at this and kind of think about, oh, actually, if it's safe to insert a needle into someone's subarachnoid space after this time, it's probably safe to do this. However, each hospital has its local guideline, and you will find that each hospital does, unfortunately, vary. Um, so as you can see, again, it clearly explains to you, oh, the patient's on um, rivoxaban at this dose, the renal function is this, therefore you would want to wait this amount of time, et cetera, et cetera. And um, things like this are very clear. And I know it seems a bit of a kind of um, easy way out for so, uh, so me to say, um, and look at this table, but this is what happens in the real world on a day-to-day -day basis. People look at this and say, oh, let me just load this up on my phone. Let me look at it. 
But if you can understand that aspirin is safe to take in for most operations, that's something that you can um, take home with you. And again, another chart like that. So the other thing that you see really um, routinely and is very important is uh, enoxaparin. Now, pretty much every hospital in the UK will administer enoxaparin at six o'clock in the evening. It's a subcut injection. Most patients will receive a, 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 a prophylactic dose. And if they're a normal weight and a normal renal function, they get 40 milligrams. <laughs> Now, if they have um, received at six o'clock in the evening and they are already in hospital and they've been booked to have an operation in the morning, that's fine because after 12 hours, that clexane at a prophylactic dose will be out of their system. So if the operation is booked for eight o'clock in the morning, that's completely fine. And you might get bleeped by, by the ward saying, oh, you know, they are due for an operation in the morning. Is it safe? to give the clexane at six in the evening. Yes, it is safe to give, assuming they have a normal um, renal function. Some other people may be in hospital because they're being treated for a PE or DVT, and they or they are being bridged because they're normally on warfarin. So you want to switch to a subcutaneous um, anticoagulant such as enoxaparin, they're on a higher dose. Um, and those people, if they're on a treatment dose of, of enoxaparin, which again is normally administered around six o'clock in the evening, you have to wait a whole day. So in these people, you have to be careful about when you do the operation. So you, you have to be mindful that if they're on the treatment dose, which is 1.5 milligram per kick, if they have a normal renal function, or if they have an impaired renal function, it's one milligram per kick. You don't need to know this, but it's nice to have in your head. Um, you have to wait a whole day. So if someone is booked on the emergency list, you will want to do that operation in around the late afternoon, perhaps, if they are uh, so receiving their clexane at uh, whatever time is uh, appropriate for that. So this is why it's very important to look through the medications. Even at the point of sending them off to sleep, it's important that you check the drug chart because sometimes drugs are administered on the ward and they aren't put onto their chart immediately. So, and I've had a few times where I, I've been thinking about doing a um, um, spinal anaesthetic and it turns out all, they, the patient has received enoxaparin one hour before, but it wasn't um, documented. So uh, that's a good thing I've checked. So aspirin, we've talked about uh, enoxaparin. I mean, if, I, you can go through each and every anticoagulant, but that's uh, so beyond the scope of this talk. Because, but aspirin and enoxaparin are the things that you will be seeing most often um, on the wards. So that's why I've uh, so discussed those two things. So we talked about uh, heme, kind of heme drugs. And now we're going to talk about um, things to do with the heart. So mostly blood pressure um, medication. Now... Uh, the control of blood pressure under a general anaesthetic and during an operation is extremely important. If you are persistently hypertensive and you are having a hypertensive, what is essentially a hypertensive emergency during an operation, that is bad. It puts a huge strain on the heart. You are at risk of having an MI during an operation or after you wake up. If your heart, if your left ventricle has been, has had to produce a mean arterial pressure of 160 throughout the time of the operation. That's just a little um, picture that I've in, that I've put on the slide there. That's very bad. Um, if you are if you have been having um, systolics that are sky high throughout the operation, you are at risk of having a stroke during the operation, or certainly whilst you wake up, because when you wake up, you will be in pain and you, and your blood pressure will go higher. So. So you don't want to have strain on the heart and, and you don't want to have a strain on the blood vessels in the brain. So it's very important that you that you take the control of blood pressure um, seriously. And again, if someone is having elective surgery 
and you can see the blood pressure is high at home, that's, a, that's the perfect opportunity to refer them to the GP and say, dear GP, this patient is booked for an operation three months time. Um, please optimize their dosing of their, I don't know, Vamipril, um, doxazacin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in terms of what to do for blood pressure medications under a general anesthetic, so all general anesthetic agents and all spinal anesthesia induce makes the patient vasodilated. So their MAP drops. However, we have seen and it's been very clearly demonstrated that it's your ACE inhibitors and your um, ARBs which drop your blood pressure much more so than your uh, calcium channel blockers. So um, if you are on, on amlodipine that is entirely fine to take on the morning of the operation assuming that you're not hypotensive but you do not want to take your morning dose of ramipril or enalapril or losartan okay if you're on a beta blocker it is entirely fine to have it and i see so many people who don't have the morning dose of of their bisoprolol and it or the morning dose of their amlodipine, and, and it really plays havoc um, with their blood pressure um, intraoperatively. Because then you're left, so if the patient has had their operation at 9 in the morning, they've woken up at lunchtime, their BP is 190 by mid-afternoon, and it's really, um, um, it's really annoying because it could have been easily avoided. Um, so, as I said, hold your ACE inhibitors, hold your ARBs, please take the calcium channel inhibitors and please take your um, beta blockers. Um, obviously, if they are in hospital because they are having septic sepsis or septic shock as a result of the bilirubin sepsis or the appendicitis, then they wouldn't be receiving their antihypertensives anyway because they are hypotensive and unwell. The other thing to mention here is um, diuretics. Now, um, what people do about diuretics is quite variable. The problem with going for an operation is is you are you are often making them a, the patient a bit dry. So you might induce a bit of an AKI, or if they already have an AKI, you may make it worse. If you're leaving them starved for a whole day, um, that can be bad. So that's why some people say you want to hold uh, diuretics. There's no clear um, a consensus and each hospital is different, but that is something to keep in mind. Um, right, anti-diabetics medication, which is really the main thing of this talk and everything else is not as long. Um, fine. So sugar is important. Um, if you have badly controlled diabetes, by virtue of a poor HbA1c, that is bad. And if you are booked for elective surgery, it's really important that you can um, that you can um, c c control your blood sugar um, in the months leading up to your operation. It has been shown to have poor wound healing. Um, you have very sort of deranged BMs lead on the day of you being fasted. You have sugar issues in during the operation when you wake up. Um, and if you have badly controlled diabetes, it means your it means your macrovascular complications are already higher anyway. Um, and if you are under the and if you're having the stress of a knife in your abdomen during the operation, compounded by the fact that you have bad arteries going into the operation, that does put your risk of having a post-op cardiac event higher. So when you think about what to do about someone who has diabetes, you, you just have to have a clear framework in your mind, and that could be answered by three things in your head. The first thing to ask yourself is, do they take insulin or not? Now, I don't like the way that people talk about diabetes with type 1 and type 2, because I feel that that isn't important. What's because you can have a type 2 diabetic who takes insulin, and for all intents and purposes, they are type 1 diabetic because they are needing insulin so what we do about it we treat them as if they are type 1 diabetic so don't think about type 1 or type 2 
think about are they uh, dependent on insulin or not because that is what is important so that's the first question to um, ask yourself number two how many meals are they going to be missing now um, if someone has been plan having planned surgery and if they are diabetic they're normally first on the list if for any reason they're on the afternoon list they should be having breakfast because you can eat six hours um, before your surgery and most lists start at two so as long as you eat as long as you have your last mouthful by eight o'clock that's okay but so you should ask yourself how many meals are they missing because if they're missing more than one that means they should be on a sliding scale which i will talk about soon and the other things is to think about is this planned surgery or is it unplanned surgery and i know i keep um, going on about it but that's really important so those three things are what you should be asking yourself and those two things are the things that you should be asked if you are unsure about it if you are making a referral to the um, I don't know, the diabetic team or the anaesthetist, those are things that, that if you can say those things, it makes you sound really good on the phone because you really know what you're talking about and what the correct information to, um, to, to have gained from the notes is. So if you're having planned surgery, and let's say that someone is going to have surgery on January and you see the HBA or NC taken yesterday's 90, that of course you can optimize it. So you, you need to refer them to their GP or the diabetic team and start thinking about what you can do about it. Because three months is a great time to start to bring someone's HBA one c down. Uh, anyone who's diabetic will get their glucose checked in hospital anyway but if they're coming for planned surgery as soon as they arrive they will have their glucose checked if you're not diabetic your glucose is not really checked there's no reason to um, if you're having lengthy surgery so longer than an hour you're and you're on insulin your glucose will be checked um, this is very important if you're on long-acting insulin do not stop it. So long-acting insulins are Levomir, Lantus, Tegeo, and if you have a medical job or if you're a uh, student now, these are the brand names that you, uh, um, that you will have in your head. So Levomir, Lantus, Tegeo are your long-acting insulins. There are more, but those those the, those those are the ones that you see most often. And if you see those, they are long-acting insulin. Okay. Um, so you will normally be advised by your team as to what to do with your long acting. So either take it at your normal dose or reduce it by um, 80%. Don't stop it because that's how you go into DKA. Okay. Right. So again, a really annoying thing. Oh, you should have a read of this, but you really should. Um, because this again, unambiguously explains what to do. And there's nothing in this document, which is in clear it clearly says if you do this if you're on this do this if you want to do that so i will now go through common examples which you will see on your f1 f2 surgical medical jobs and um what the correct guidance is but sometimes unfortunately doesn't happen so um you've got um uh, great, yeah. Um, someone's writing. Oh, yeah. Um, long acting examples. Good. So, um, fine. So you've got an example here. Someone, a um, middle aged, they're having a planned operation, uh, to remove the tonsils. They're on the morning operating list. Let's say they book for January, um, and their HbA1c is fifty. They're on metformin. They ate last night. Um, and um, they had water this morning at six o'clock, both of which are completely fine. You can have water two hours leading up to your surgery. And as I said at the start, you can have sips of water even up to half an hour before the operation if you're taking your medication. They've arrived into hospital and their morning sugar is 5.8, entirely normal. And the question is, what what is the correct thing to have advised about the metformin? Now, metformin is the classic thing that's taught in medical school and all in all your prescribing exams that it has a it has a higher risk of inducing a lactic acidemia, um, and certainly it's worse if you have NAKI. 
So what we say is we hold the morning dose of the metformin because when you are being starved and um, with the stresses that goes on during surgery, you're a little bit more likely to develop an AKI. And if you're taking metformin, that just puts you at high risk. Certainly to stop a dose of metformin is not going to cause harm with your, with your blood sugar control. And that is what uh, you will see when you write the discharge letter. Just ensure that the patient understands that they have to go back on their metformin. Okay. Um, example two. So, so this is the other example. Now, watch how the slide changes now. The things I've changed are the HbA1c and the sugar. So you can see the same woman planned surgery. Now she has a more uh, um, deranged HbA1c, 60. That's not good. She's on the same medication. She ate and drank at the same time. But her morning glucose is now 19.8. Okay. So, in this instance, we say, really, the operation should not go ahead. Now, this is not a life-saving operation, okay? This is planned surgery. This is someone who's been waiting for many months. Obviously, that's not nice. But if you are having elective surgery, and if your sugars are that out of control, number one, you should check they're not in DKA. So once you have ruled out that with a normal blood ketone level, of course, um, you should think about, well, their blood sugars are already wildly off. They have a bad HbA1c. The sugar is 19.8. Once they go with the stress of surgery, it will go really high. Um, it will lead to all sorts of problems with wound healing, infection risk. And you discuss with the surgical team and the anaesthetic team, and it's a joint decision. Okay, let's send this patient home, not do the operation. And um, that's what we would say. And certainly, I've had patients who've had the operations cancelled because the blood sugar was 13, 14. And those operations have have quite an important need to have wound healing or if you're doing kind of pain intervention operations where you're doing perhaps a caudal nerve block or a nerve denervation where you're putting really fine needles into someone's um, um, epidural space you do not want any chance of infection so you want to avoid any chance of that happening so that's why you may decide to say no. And that's something that you need to be aware of and appreciate when you are the doctor on the ward um, as the F1, F2 doctor. Okay. Um, fine. So now I've changed something again. Um, what have I changed? Yeah. So I've now said, ah, they have a normal blood sugar in the morning. And an acceptable HbA1c's planned operation, but in this example, you have seen the EGFR taken a few days ago is low, and it's 42. Okay, so the correct thing to do to, for the metformin is to um, hold it on the day and probably hold it for the next day or two. Recheck their uh, UNEs. Now you can either send them home and ask the GP to redo it, although in the real world I'm quite confused as to how this happens because in order to get the appointment takes a few days anyway. And um, you know, so you, for those of you who are watching this who are war doctors will understand that this may not really happen. Um, but so certainly if they are staying as an inpatient, you can just redo their blood and then you can restart the metformin because if you are on metformin with an acutely, uh, so reduced EGFR, that's when it's a bit risky. And now I've changed another thing and now I'm saying they take insulin. Okay. And so they take insulin, Lantus, Lantus is a long acting insulin. They take it at night time. They ate and drank at the appropriate time. The morning sugar is 7.8, which is normal. And so the correct thing to do for the long-acting insulin is to A, not stop it. So they take the insulin at night still. However, what you have to do is ask them to reduce their dose down. So they, in this instance, you reduce it down to eight units. And if they have their, if they're first on the operating list, that's excellent. They will wake up hopefully around 11 o'clock and they will eat a late lunch and have a normal dinner, hopefully. 
and they will also continue their lances as normal. If they're having a bowel operation, they have and they have to remain nil by mouth after the wake up, perhaps they have an NG or they've had a bowel resection, that's fine. They should still take their lantus, okay? But they will be fed and they may have NG feeding or they may have um, 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 TPN feeding. So it means they're still being fed and they should still take the insulin. But at this point, they will have had expert, um, ex expert advice by the diabetic team. So now in this example, I've said um, it's a planned operation. They were meant to be on the morning list, but for various reasons due to the delays, etc., the operation has been uh, delayed until the afternoon. So they have missed their breakfast and their lunch. So that's two missed meals in someone who is an insulin-dependent diabetic. They've had their nighttime dose of long-acting insulin, which is the correct thing to have done. They've fasted at the correct time and their morning sugars are now um, deranged. Now, you, in this instance, what you may do is say, oh, hang on, they've missed both um, meals and they should be put on a sliding scale. Now, some people would say, now again, each hospital does vary. Um, if you're an insulin dependent diabetic and you're missing one meal, then you may not need a sliding scale. But if you're missing more than one meal, you should definitely be put onto a sliding scale. Okay, because that's when your sugars get deranged, etc. etc. Um and some people might look at this and say, Oh, hang on, this is a planned operation, the sugars are very high. Should we just keep them in for a day and then to correct their sugars and then do the operation the next day, etc. etc. Um, that's really so dependent on um, where you're working. Um, but I just put this in to show that someone who is insulin dependent on um, diabetes, their sugars are just a bit more harder to control. And this is something that you will see not too infrequently. OK, but the important thing here is to ex understand that they will need a sliding scale. And I, I, I don't know what level people are at have, are, are about watching this, but a sliding scale is when you are receiving IV insulin with IV dextrose, and the rate of the insulin is altered on an hourly basis by the blood sugar. Okay, and because it's being in IV, it's easier to control. Okay, so that's a really long discussion about insulin, but that is really the mainstay of this talk. Now we're going to talk about steroids. So in summary, you can be on steroids because you've got a rheumatological problem which you need suppression for, or you can be on steroids because you have an actual endocrine problem. So you aren't making steroids, so you need to be supplemented steroids. That's quite uncommon, but so most people are on steroids because they have something in their body which needs to be suppressed. And you will have learned all these uh, so conversions of what steroid is equal to what. But what you have to understand is, is someone is on equivalent to more than five milligrams of prednisolone once a day, taken orally, for more than a month. In the last three months, they are at a theoretical risk of having adrenal suppression. Therefore, when they are under a situation where their adrenal glands have to work harder, such as under a general anesthetic, when you're having a knife in the abdomen, you will not be able to mount the same response. So if you are in intensive care where your body is like being run over by a bus every single day that you're there, you will not be able to mount the same um, response. So in these people, you need to think about, do you need to give them extra steroid? Um, just about this slide, so patients who are on steroids, all you have to do is ask them because they would have had it hammered home into them what you have to do when you are um, having a sick day. So when you are acutely unwell or if you're having an operation. Again, a really another um, annoying thing saying, please read. This is a really excellent, excellent guideline. Again, unambiguously tells you exactly what you need to do. Um, this is again by AGBI. It's all at the end of this talk, so you can uh, get the references. 
So we've got a middle-aged woman who's having a planned operation to have a, her uterus um, removed. Maybe the indication is in mass or um, fibroids. And she has very bad asthma. She's due to commence a biological agent. And in for the past six months, she's been on an oral dose of steroid. If obviously, if you are on an, if you're on oral steroids for asthma, you've got very bad asthma. So what is the correct thing to do for this, um, woman coming for a planned operation? So you definitely do not stop it because you do not want her to be going into an asthma attack leading up to the op on in, in the operation. Asthmatics are at much higher risk of having bronchospasm under a general anaesthetic, which is an anaesthetic emergency, um, which is outside the realms of this talk. Um, but yes, so the correct thing to do is to supplement this woman with IV steroid at induction because that will tide her over for the um, to be able to help her mount a stress response whilst the operation is going. Now, the guidelines are this to give 100 of hydrocort and a 200 milligram infusion over a, um, a day. I've actually never seen that happen, but those are the recommended guidelines. What happens in the real world is if most patients at induction of any anaesthetic, so if it's an appendix, if it's a knee operation, get dexamethasone at induction by the anaesthetist, not because they have any reason to from an endo endocrin endocrinological point of view, but because it, dexamethasone works as an anti emetic at a dose of 0.15 mg per kick, which normally works out to this dose, 6.6 .6 mg per, per individual. Therefore, they don't receive any extra steroid because they are receiving such a high dose of dexamethasone. However, if for any reason they are not receiving dexamethasone at induction and they need steroid supplementation, the guidance is that you should be giving them hydrocode. In the real world, again, what you might see, some people uh, are getting dexamethasone and hydrocortisone, which isn't really the guidance. Um, and so that's something to keep in your mind. But if someone is on steroids, you should be, in your mind, you should be thinking, oh, they're going for an operation, they're on steroids. I should expect them to have received extra steroids. And certainly, if a patient is unusually hypotensive after the operation on your ward, you should be thinking, oh, is it because they are in having, they are steroid deplete? As I said before, people can be on steroids long term because they need it for some rheumatological issue or they have an actual adrenal failure. If this is the case, they need to be given, they definitely do need to be given hydrocortisone, even if they have received dexamethasone for anti-emetic indication at um, induction, because you will recall from all your talks at uh, medical school, some steroids are glucocorticoids, some are mineral. Dex is just uh, glucocorticoid, so you will not be able to offer a um, mineral corticoid action by giving dex alone so if you uh, have a patient who is on steroids because their adrenal glands don't work not because of rheumatoid arthritis or, or whatever then they you have to make sure they have um, received supplementation for, for both their mineral and the glucocorticoid in, um, indications so that's um, steroids. There is obviously loads more to talk about with steroids, but that is under the guidance of an endocrinologist, which I am not. But that's just something that you might see on your ward. Um, so anti-epileptic medication and anti-Parkinsonian um, medication, definitely in some if you have a um, geriatrics job or if you have an orthopedic job as an F1, F2, this is the patient group in whom um, this will be relevant. So you've got a, a elderly man who's having a planned umbilical hernia repair. He has a history of Parkinson's disease and epilepsy, both of which are well controlled with uh, medication. He has been smartly booked first on the morning operating list. The operation started at nine o'clock. We um, ended it at midday and we woke him up 
so extubated, i.e. removal of the IGEL or removal of the um, ET tube, just after midday. He's due his L-DOPA at one o'clock and his liver teracetam um, at eight in the morning. So what do we do about this? So if he's due his morning anti-epileptic agent at eight o'clock and he's due for an operation at nine o'clock, he must take it at eight o'clock, even though, as I said, even if he's nil by mouth, ensure with a sip of water, he takes his anti-epileptic medication at eight in the morning. OK, um, as you know, you are at high risk of having seizures if you have electrolyte as a derangement, which may happen under a GA or in the post-operative period. If you have missed your anti-epileptic medication, that's bad. So you should continue all anti-epileptic agents. There are really wonderful interactions with some of some analgesic agents and some anesthetic agents with some anti-epileptic agents, which are outside the realms of this talk, but they should continue and you their anti-epileptic agents. If for treatment of the Parkinson's disease, they on dopamine agonists, so L-DOPA, um, it is crucial that they receive it as close to their time as they can. So, as hopefully they're extubated at around midday and they are awake enough that they can swallow their oral medication by one o'clock and you avoid interruption at the dosing um, regimen. So, if you have someone on your ward who is um, due medication at 11 o'clock in the morning, and the operation is at nine o'clock in the morning, that's not great. So you may try to plan them so the operation happens in the afternoon, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the kind of um, logistical um, uh, housekeeping things, which are, can be an absolute nightmare on the ward. Um, but th these are the reasons why. And that is it for anti-epileptic and um, um, Parkinson meds don't stop them okay oxygen if someone is needing oxygen for any reason leading up to the operation obviously don't stop it I think it's excellent practice to document what they are saturating and at what FO2 it really annoys me when I read a discharge letter in someone who has COPD and their baseline stats are not documented because when they get admitted in a few weeks time with IE COPD, it's really hard to know if they have normal SATs or not. So that's important. Okay. They may be on long-term oxygen or they may be acutely needing oxygen because they're, they are um, splinting because they have an abdominal issue. They can't take a deep breath and they're needing oxygen uh, because of that. Um, they may need oxygen because they're an inpatient and they have developed a HAP whilst also having a ruptured bowel, etc. Um, obviously, needing oxygen immediately increases your risk for anaesthetic complications at induction of anaesthesia because when you're induced, your FRC, which is the volume, which is your um, volume in your lungs, which is at the end of expiration. So anyway, this is not an anaesthetic talk, but anyway, um, you will need much greater levels of oxygen once you are sent to sleep. Once you are, once we make you stop breathing, you will need a higher FO2 whilst the operation is happening, and you will need a greater need for oxygen once you wake up. So that's very important that it's very that everyone knows that patient is on oxygen. Now, CPAP. If a patient is on CPAP at home at night. And if they're having planned surgery in you know, um, many weeks or months, or if they're having emergency surgery, it's really important that they bring the CPAP machine in so that it can be used at night on the ward. Because if they're already a little bit drowsy by having received opioids um, and they go to sleep at night, they're they are already, they we already know they are obstructing their airway because they are using CPAP at night for OSA. They should bring the CPAP in, and that's so important. So if you're a um, medical doctor or a surgical doctor on the ward, you, you have a patient who is there in the morning, 
and they haven't brought their machine in and they're going for a morning operation, if you can, please ask them to ring their relatives or you ring their relatives to bring the CPAP machine in and to know which which number to plug in. Um, because it's normally like setting one, two, three, four. And it's often quite hard to find in kind of uh, sort of spiritual letters as to what setting it should be in. So yes, if they're on CPAP, please make sure they bring it in. Okay. Obviously, there are some operations where you don't want to apply a tight um, mask on. So some max fax, max fax, max fax operations, some ENT operations, um, some uh, thoracic operations because of the pressure that the CPAP generates. That's all quite rare things. But yeah, so oxygen CPAP. So those are things to keep in your mind. And, and it's in this talk because oxygen is a drug. Um, analgesia, sedative agents. So whatever they're on, do not stop it. If they're on morning gabapentin, if they're on morning amitriptyline, do not stop it because these patients have built a new um, starting point. So you want to start the anesthetic, start the operation at, at that set point, whatever their set point is, because if you stop it, they will need a hell of a lot more opioid than they otherwise would and these patients already have a higher need for opioid because their enzyme induces um, and control of pain is important bad control of pain leads to um, taking um, more shallow breaths therefore you need oxygen for longer it increases your stress response it, it leads to impaired wound healing it leads to ileus it leads to delayed mobilizing and that all those things are bad. If a patient is on methadone, they do um, uh, um, um, receive it when in hospital. It just has to be prescribed and the oncol pharmacist will be able to get it. So don't um, deny someone their normal dose of Oromorph if they're on Oromorph at home. If they need it on the morning of the operation, let them have it. That's totally fine. Um, okay, and reflux, so if the patient normally takes omeprazole at 8 o'clock in the morning and their operation is at 9 in the morning, let them have it. Do not stop omeprazole. In fact, I have prescribed omeprazole one hour before the operation if they aren't even normally on it, yet they clearly have reflux. We give a PPI, certainly leading up to an anesthetic, because you, the uh, the PPI doesn't obviously stop the reflux from happening, but if it happens, it reduces the chance of aspiration pneumonitis happening. Because if you get acid into your lungs, that's bad. But if you get liquid off a normalish pH, that's less bad. Okay, so that's very important. Doctor, am I allowed to take my morning uh, morning omeprazole, lanzaprazole? Yes, you can have it. Okay, now, oh, sorry, my slides changed. Yeah, the other thing again, it's just a one slide thing. We have uh, so we started so uh, so we started at five minutes past. So I will end on time. Don't worry. Um, so yes, I'm HRT DMARD. So we've got a woman who is middle aged who is booked for a planned operation to have her joint operation, so a, a joint um, replacement um, revised. If you don't know, anyone who's having a uh, revision of a joint surgery means that the operation will be long. It will be very long, like, th like two to four hours. Um, that's also a nice little pub quiz medical knowledge. So revision of joint operations are long operations. This woman has got rheumatoid arthritis, for which she takes uh, methotrexate. She's also on um, HRT, um, combined HRT. So the advice is as you can to continue your uh, um, uh, methotrexate because we don't want her to have poorly controlled rheumatoid arthritis leading up to her operation. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, as you know, is a multi-system um, disease. It affects your heart, it affects your lung, it affects your joints, it affects your um, healing. Um, so that's um, bad.
but also you do it with the knowledge that methotrexate itself and other immunosuppressive agents also impair um, um, wound healing. So it's a joint decision, but on the whole, we say it is okay to continue your methotrexate. If you are on HRT, so combined HRT, the general advice is, but it's not always followed, is to stop the HRT four weeks prior because your chances of, of it of, of of a VTE are higher a, a bit higher anyway by being on HRT um, which is why you know as part of the I'm mean, certainly from my medical school days for OSCEs it's one of the things you have to ask someone you know have you ever had a a, a, a VTE before anyone in the family history have um, clots etc anyway so having an operation immediately puts your chances of a VT of having a VTE up. If you are having an operation and you have another risk factor for developing VTE, i.e., being on a, a combined HRT, that means that your chances of VTE are higher. Therefore, it may be a joint decision that we will ask you to stop your HRT for four weeks prior. So your risk of having a VTE is no greater than someone else. Okay, so that as a as a mini kind of sermon on um, medications, and now fluid and substantiation. Now, if you if anyone watching this is interested in anaesthetics, um, then this is this is what anaesthesia is: is having the the really sick patient coming in. And you have to manage their fluid, you have to manage their electrolytes, which are obviously in, in contained in the fluid. They are acutely unwell and they are on warfarin and they've just started to bleed or they have a hole in their bowel and they've taken their morning dose of uh, a clopidogrel. Or they are hypotensive because they've lost a load of fluid in the last few days. And they have unfortunately taken the morning dose of Vamipril. They've also not been able to take the insulin for the last two days because they've been too drowsy. And now they're in DKA, but they need an operation. So all the things that I've been talking about in the last like 50 minutes or so comes into play when you are the uncle anesthetist for uh, emergency surgery. And you're presented with this man. So this is a man... Um, one day, Abdur Payne had a CT, still in resars. He's got a hole in his bowel and he's got ischemic bowel. The ischemia has led to a lactate of eight. He's very dry. He's got a base deficit of minus six because he's been diarrhea for the past few days. He's hypo, uh, uh, kalemic. He's, uh, he has an acidemia with a pH of 7.1. And you're looking at the gas thinking, oh God, he's got, uh, so potassium of 2.5 and a pH of 7.1. If I induce this man for an anaesthetic, he is very likely to have a, he's a li likely to uh, arrest at induction. Also got an AKI, also got an HB of 68. So his delivery of oxygen is going to be very impaired and is hypotensive and he's needing oxygen. So all these things that I've talked about, this is really where you have to think. All the other things I've talked about is kind of easy to ma well, easy-ish to manage because it's planned. This is someone who's unplanned. This is where you, um, you really have to engage your brain and think about what to do. So you are the on-call surgical F1 or surgical F2. You have been asked to see this patient and you bleep the anesthetist. You bleep your consultant. The on-call anesthetist has bleeped their consultant, the ITU reg. Um, so I've... As IT reg on call, I've certainly have seen many patients like these um, in resar saying, oh, hi, I've got this guy, needs to have an operation, but he's very unwell at the moment. What do we do? So you're going to think about, are you going to optimize them for a few hours in resars? Are you going to insert a central line or and even a VASCAF in resars? and delay things there in a planned way so you can optimize the potassium, op optimize the fluid, start noradrenaline perhaps in resource and wait for an hour or two so they're in a slightly better state so they can cope with the incredible stress on the physiology by undergoing a laparotomy 
under a general anesthetic or are you going to say no delaying definitive surgery which is to remove the source of ischemia so having a bowel resection by waiting every hour that's bad so are we going to wait and optimize or are we going to just go into theater so that's obviously a very high level uh, a decision made by uh, the consultant surgeon and the consultant anesthetists um, but it's very important that you can think about these type of patients in this way and you can kind of merge all the type of things that I've been talking about so far. Um, so, I mean, there's no right answer for this scenario, um, but this happened. This patient will go to uh, um, intensive care. It's, it's going to be a risky anesthetic. They may die in the first day after the operation, they may not survive the GA, or if they have loads of other comorbidities, we may decide not to do not to do the operation and make them end of life. Um, the other thing to keep about keep in your mind about fluids, and I've got a few minutes left, um, is to say that most patients under a GA receive a liter of fluid in the operation. It's not really done with any kind of um, you know, like minute to minute control, they just receive a bag of fluid um, and they receive another litre a little bit more slowly. They have obviously a lot of insensible losses if they're having an abdominal surgery and if it's a lengthy operation, they may receive more. But most patients, if they're going for an operation, will have received a litre of fluid or certainly have started to receive a litre of fluid. It's if they are having emergency surgery, it's quite important that it's done finely tuned. So you want to think about what you're giving. So you want to be giving some potassium at replacement IV, perhaps. And if they have a bad heart, you don't want to be overloading them. And we talk about fluid management, but it's really in the real world, in an exam situation, it's, you know, we can say, you know, do they have dry lips? Do they have dry mucous membranes? Do they have... Uh, cold hands, uh, so cap refill, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in the real world, it's it's practically quite difficult to do outside of intensive care, because in intensive care you can monitor the urine output without almost any error by the hour. You can you have exact control about what's going into their vein um, down to the last um, milliliter. You can have blood gases every hour. And that's how you can really control the fluid intake. Something which is really important, it's quite a nice thing to look at, which is often quite a, a bit of a secret, is, is what's looking at the swing on someone's line. Now, if you have an ITU job or if you have a, just a normal job, you can look at someone's waveform in both the arterial line and their SATS probe trace. Now, on the top left, there's this wiggly red line, which has this meandering um, waveform that someone's SATS probe, you may say it looks like a torsade. It, it, it's not, this is someone's SATS probe. You will see it has a slight swing on it. Now, it's not that so reliable, but if it does have a marked swing, that tells you that they're dry because the way that the SATS probe works um, is that it detects the, the, the 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 flow of blood at the end of your tips of your fingers and if they if you are very dry you're going to have quite a variable volume that's reached to the end of your tips as a result of a variable stroke volume and therefore if you have a patient who's dry they will have um, this swing on their sats probe compare that to the picture on the top right where it's there is no swing each the top part of each um um, waveform is in line with the previous one. I don't know if anyone watching this has had an intensive care job or if you have been in an operating theatre, if they have an arterial line, that's even better because if they are fully ventilated, and this is very um, anaesthetic, but it might be of interest to some of you, you will see the picture on the bottom left has a swing, just how the, the top of each waveform is different from the previous one. It doesn't reach the height the previous one did whereas the picture on the bottom right reaches the peak so that i can look at this and say that the patient who 
from whom the diagram on the bottom left has been taken is dry, whereas the patient on the bottom right is not dry, they're well filled. And that is something to think about. So I've talked about all these things here so medications and fluids. I'm just approaching one hour, um, or just over so one hour. But this is what you want to uh, take away. This is not something that you are expected to be doing on your own. But if you are the doctor on the ward, you do need to be aware that some medications may have been stopped and started. Um, so ensure that when they're being discharged, that things are in place, that they know what medication to restart. Everything is risk versus benefit. Someone could bleed by having an operation whilst ha having a high dose of antiplatelet or anticoagulant. But there's also a delay. There's also a risk by not doing the operation. Um, guidelines are guidelines, and you will have seen that every if you have someone, if you are a doctor who has worked at lots of different hospitals, you always know that each hospital has such various guidelines. And just as a little plug, if you have liked the last two slides that I talked about with that very sick man in recess, and you are wanted someone, if you want to control someone's pharmacology and physiology down to the last stroke volume down to the last blood gas etc etc and you find that interesting then i would strongly recommend that you consider a career as a doctor in anesthesia so that is what i wanted to talk about in this slide that's exactly one hour these are the references um that i've taken it from i again really really do recommend reading those and i don't mean to be annoying by being a speaker saying oh you should read this book you should read this article but i can't but those three documents cannot explain it any better than i can um so that's the end of my talk um if anyone has any questions please feel free to type but otherwise amarinda can um guide me on what i need to be doing now hello uh, yeah. that was that was really good um yeah, this the the I learned about the arterial and the pulse oximetry swing actually ironically a few weeks ago. Oh yeah, good. to hear it from hear it from yourself. I was like, wow, okay, it's, yeah. it wasn't just my consultant talking. Yeah, you do to me. That's nah, cool. But yeah, as um, Prasanth just said, if any of you have any burning questions, please type them in the chat, and he will use his knowledge to answer them. And you will all be getting certificates of attendance after this as well. And you will actually get, be getting a certificate as well, present. Oh, okay. I'll send you your email just for your portfolio. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank That's you. it. That's all right. Uh, so we'll give them five minutes for any questions. Mm -hmm. And if any of you are leaving, please uh, fill in the feedback as well. Oh, hello. I think. Ah, oh, it's already there. That's the automatic feedback. Mm hmm. Oops, right, let's see if there are one more minute for questions and I think we'll call it. It was very in depth though, I must say. In oh, a good way. In a in a good oh, way, in a good way. No problem. Mm. That's it. I think we'll call it there. But if anyone does have any burning questions that they've forgotten, you can send them to me, and I will. Well, for example, with your permission, I'm happy. Would you be okay with me emailing you any questions? There? Yeah, no, yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right, fine. 
Cool, then. Thank you very much. That is the end of the talk. Have you got anything to add? No, not for mine. Thank you, guys. Perfect. All right, then. Um, see you later. Um, all the best. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. Bye.